Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. We have got a fantastic show today talking about physical availability, what it is, the, the three main components of it, why it makes marketing scope so much bigger than just ad creative, uh, why digital ads aren't even ads, they're sometimes just better thought of as signage. This is a great show and I hope you stick around for the post pod. Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast, a place for business leaders to get the best and most credible information on marketing, strategy and innovation. Your hosts, Mark Binkley and Vasily Sturos, share their experiences as they gather insights from the world's leading experts. Now, on with the show. Well, welcome to the show today. We have Ari Tanusanjaya. Tanusanjaya. Really close. I, oh, how do, okay, sorry. How do, how, how do I say it properly? No, Tanusanjaya. Okay, so it wasn't so far. I was it trying was to say it slow the first time just so I didn't <laughs> mispronounce it, and then I sped it up. <laughs> Dr. Um, T for short. He's Dr. got the T. sideburns too. No. <laughs> I need to have a mohawk. Yeah, and <laughs> exactly. A few more gold chains. <laughs> um so ari we're super excited to have you here this is literally going to be the first time we've ever i think talked to anybody about physical availability which is one half of um the market-based asset uh evidence-based theory around how brands grow and so it's such a massive component around how brands grow and so yeah we're just so excited to talk to you about this today so thanks for joining us it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I should have said that you're a senior marketing scientist at the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, and, and you've spent a long time studying and researching and publishing findings around uh, primarily uh, physical, ability, physical avail availability. Um, so maybe we can just start there with defining mental and physical availability for people who don't know what that means. Sure. So mental availability and physical availability are the two main pillars of, you know, how to grow a brand, really. So how to make the brands easy to think about in buying situations or in user situations, as well as easy to find um, in purchasing uh, situations as well, right? So some of the, uh, one of the shortcut that I've used for myself would be like easy to mind, easy to find. Right. So, mm -hmm. for example, if I if I'm going to to if if I want to buy a new computer, what brand would come to mind, mm -hmm. and can I easily find it um, online or in stores around me? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. In, in in essence, it's sort of like making that. the brand sort of like easy to think about. Sort of like, okay, I, I'm, right. I'm thirsty. What brand do I want to drink, and can I find it easily? Right. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. And it's funny. I'm, yeah, I know you set me up for this. So I'm going to go into this. <laughs> find a computer. Story time with Mark Binkley. Yeah. I won't go into the whole rigmarole around right, what I wrote in the prep notes. But but it was really fascinating for a whole bunch of reasons. Because I never, like, I knew I was preparing for this interview. And so I, I paid attention to what were the things that were influencing me in buying a computer. So I went online. I purchased actually a computer and I returned it because I it didn't it was a lot of money all at once and I was just like I'm yep. starting a business and you know I was kind of trying to lower my cost so then I started looking for leasing programs and then I found out that Mac has a leasing program and so that was great but the one I really wanted was a 16 inch they didn't sell that in the leasing program and so mm -hmm. I ended up with yep. a 14 inch um and it took honestly, like a really long period of time, relatively compared to what I thought. I thought I'd go into the store one day, buy a computer. Um, yeah. And so in that sense, I was a B2B buyer going to a yes. B2B, B2C shop, so to speak. Um, but the process was re really interesting. So from a, from a availability point of view, I thought it was fascinating because like there was lots of choices for me. And eventually I got to a point where I was just, I gave up on like trying to find the perfect thing. And I ended up just buying the thing that I could get the 14 inch MacBook pro because it was the one that was available on that leasing mm. program. Yeah. And so do you think there's anything in that story that's related to like physical availability and how important <laughs> physical availability like, <laughs> is? Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. Because I think even in that little, little in in that story in, or that experience, it in, uh, encapsulates like the three main components of physical availability. So within physical availability, there is presence, mm-hmm. which is basically how widely available they are in in the distribution points. Um, and in the case of, say, durables or tangible goods, basically, consumer mm-hmm. packaged mm-hmm. goods, how easy to find them in, on shelves, uh, the location in store. Mm-hmm. So after presence, there's also prominence. Like, can we actually find them easily oh. on shelves, like because of the pack size, because of the colors? Right. Um, so this is where distinctive assets really um, are, re- are really important. Right. Third one is portfolio. Basically, would the brand have the right option for me? Mm. In your case, if you want to have a 16-inch um, uh, uh, computer um, and then it doesn't have all of the necessary features for you, then perhaps, you know, that what you did was basically move to uh, the next best thing, a 14-inch, for example. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, when buying shampoo, for example, if you have a sensitive uh, scalp or skin, then you would want to have a hypoallergenic option. And if that they don't have it, technically the consumers can buy your competitors who have that option for you. Right. So that's why presence, um, prominence, and portfolio are really important for physical availability. So I think this is also a point where I can um, correct the misnomer. Like if, if some people think that, oh, physical availability is just like, the Ehrenberg Bass Institute way of saying distribution. Right. Well, it actually goes beyond just distribution because it also considers all other elements um, that are related to making the product easy to purchase and that basically helping the consumers finding the product that is for them. Mm-hmm. S- sorry. So when you're saying like it goes beyond just the, the actual distribution of the product, making it easily available, it's you would argue then like the the leasing plans for example becomes part of that equation that often is overlooked as a part of like physical availability am i understanding that right correct correct so basically allowing the consumers to make the purchase uh, almost like seamlessly right so mm-hmm. for you to go to that particular leasing company that means the brand itself is already in your mind that you go to that particular leasing company not the other leasing company mm-hmm. but then um, when you go to that leasing company, would would they have the product option uh, or specs that are, that are right for you? Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, Mark, maybe this one is kind of more for you. I wonder, like, in that case, is, like, the company is prioritizing maybe slower moving product, offering, say, the leasing plan to make sure that product is moving, where maybe the 16-inch is not part of that because it already naturally has a high affinity towards consumers. I don't know. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's interesting because then it's it does play into availability in terms of how they choose to price and and support that uh, computer with that leasing uh, plan because it was the M3, the new model. Um, yep, and it's and it's only available in a fourteen inch through this leasing plan. Um, and the cost to go up to the 16 inch is so crazy. It's like, I mean, for me, it was like, it was the equivalent of the other computer I bought. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Just to go from a 14 to a six. So it's crazy. And so I, I chose not to, but all their old models, like the M2 models that had the 16 inch weren't available in this leasing program. I, su- mm. I suspect because their inventory is much lower and they're selling through that kind of stuff and they're already on discount. So they're just like, you know, just letting that take you know the market will chew that up eventually slow maybe at a slower rate but i think they're trying to incentivize the new latest greatest thing and finding ways to get people to buy that stuff yeah but i think that's why in a way there's this two pillars mental and physical availability um in terms of you know how brands grow right it 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 almost like enlarged the, the the scope of marketing not just within yeah. the domains of just advertising on mm-hmm. cre- our creatives, but also thinking about, oh, well, okay, how do we market that? So like, how do we sort of like work closely with distribution with, with the sales team right. um, mm-hmm. and, and crafting the right product, the, the right portfolio products, making them look and feel 
as us yeah and ensuring that they're they have the best sort of like presence out there in the market yeah so that's why i think um in a way the, the this goes beyond you know, like the traditional notion of marketing is just like in the domain of of sort of like creatives or, or advertising. yeah mm-hmm. it's a good point because that it, in that particular store i don't know if you guys have best buy but it, uh, in australia but we no we don't so it's an electronics consumer electronics store um yeah and it's like a lot of other retail shops in the sense that they have some key partners with a, with a shop in a shop. Mm-hmm. And so they have a particular area that's carved out that's really well branded with the Apple logo. And it's designed yes. to sort of simulate an Apple store in a way, in the way yeah. that it's displayed. And it looks unique and different from the other areas where you can buy computers. Yes. And so... It, I didn't know where the Apple computers were, but I did see the Apple sign. And so I, I, you know, I went there assuming that there's going to be computers and other things that, that were there too. So the, the signage yeah. within the store and using the distinctive assets that I also see in their advertising and all that kind of stuff helped me find it and locate yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is also a, a, a nice sort of like point to discuss. Sometimes brands just, or marketers uh, create sort of like really uh, challenges for themselves in mm-hmm. changing the product look and feel, changing the the packaging, wow. changing the logo, and then basically yeah. that the shortcuts that people have in their mind when they go to stores, no, it doesn't look like that anymore. Now we have a new new logo. It's like, come on, you make things easy for for consumers to mm-hmm. actually clinch that sales to to make to make a purchase because you know of of marketers feeling bored or mm-hmm. to change something that is such a great example we, we've had numerous conversations with roger martin and in one of the episodes he was talking about how marketers usually knee-jerk reaction you're going into a new organization what do you do let's refresh the brand let's uh, relaunch the brand let's do all these because everyone wants to add their own like uniqueness if you will or, or spin again make that like the answer to all the problems like if we re- relaunch a brand we'll we have a new platform to communicate against our audiences. Yep. But just listening to you, what you're telling us right now, it's like, why create that? Why self-create that that more friction, if you will, or that barrier for to the consumer, where yep. there likely have already been some level of mental availability that's been created with everything, you know, before one's arrival, where you can just kind of build on and you know continue that legacy. And um, I think we often forget about the the, the actual impact these rebrands have over the course of time yeah and i have a little bit of of ex- recent experience or anecdotes as well so i don't wake up like this so i have to sort of like groom my hair my <laughs> hair as well making them under control <laughs> and so i ran out of of the brand of of hair you know Product. play that, yeah. that i purchased um then because of that i thought like I, I couldn't. I can't wait to to purchase online. So I have to find something, a brand that mm. I used to purchase before. Mm-hmm. And then before I go to the supermarket, I find out that the product is not sold on, in the supermarket chains anymore. And then through you know further googling, just because you know I'm a curious person, <laughs> the product was actually discontinued two years ago. And two years ago, they actually did a repackaging. They created, they put extra ingredients in their products, you know, mm-hmm. in different perfume, uh, different sort of like features as well. Mm-hmm. And then they changed the, the look and feel completely. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And then the product, the brand died. As, as I posted on, on LinkedIn, I said, I don't think it, this is a coincidence at all. Mm-hmm. Because basically, I navigated through the shelves from the the pack look the brand look and uh, packaging the look and feel, and then if they changed the the packaging look and feel, I you know there was no shortcut for me anymore, and mm-hmm. it w- I actually couldn't remember the brand name of mm-hmm. that particular, particular product, but I remember yeah, yeah. the packaging, hmm. and um, and sometimes marketers also overuse this notion of innovation. Mm-hmm. as a way to band-aid the, the, the brand's poor performance, right? It's like, okay, we're not selling the product. And then, so we need to put something in our product. We need to mm-hmm. make it spicier, smell better, to be thinner, to be thicker, to sort of yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. whereas in fact, 
just fix the mental and physical availability first. See whether there are any deficiencies in the market mm -hmm. and see if the brand can deliver them better. I know it's not as sexy as repackaging or... <laughs> yeah. Or, or yeah, yeah re retooling and being super innovative and launching something disruptive, Correct. right? Like <clears throat> Correct. I can't put that on LinkedIn, Ari. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because uh, I had, a, I mean, we're going to all trade off these stories, but I, there's a kind That's of chips, I like. I, there's a kind of chips that I love and the packaging was, uh, I think it was, it was salt and pepper chips. So it was like white and black, black. kind of coloring on the bag. And then they changed yeah. it to blue. And for months I couldn't find them. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they were, maybe they moved the location, but they're still there. They just, but, Different but physically, like they didn't look the same. And I, I visually just didn't see them. They didn't go through my, um, yeah, I didn't recognize it. So I ended up choosing something that was close and, and that, and I just substituted. Yeah. yeah. There's so many experiences as well in my personal consumption when sort of like the product was not sold on shelf or sold out and then those kind of tensions actually allow the consumers to pick the competitors mm -hmm. it's like if i can't find their option they always buy on shelf and it's it's you know it's no longer there it's sold out or that they did a complete repackaging or base yeah or you know something happened between the relationship with between the manufacturer and the retailers it allowed consumers to sort of like reassess the options as well and go to the other to the, the other thing in their repertoire because mm -hmm. we need to remember that at the end of the day consumers would satisfy rather than you know having a hundred percent loyalty towards a particular brand. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so many stories. It's funny because like we, <laughs> your point was so good. Like we make this so complicated in some ways, and and really it isn't like consumers are going to you know for the most part choose within a a group of options yep mm -hmm. and if we do things to diminish their ability to recognize the product or yes. or move it or make it hard to find they're just yep. going to find something else <laughs> exactly and then this is the thing like i think at the end of the day the role of physical availability is uh, is to Eliminate any potential barriers um, for them to consume the category, or for them to for consumers to also con to consume a purchase or use mm -hmm. the brand, right? Um, rather than adding unnecessary barriers, and it's just like it, it's not really productive. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get your perspective on this. Uh, there's a Domino's case study that. Um, I heard about a long time ago, and then while we we're preparing for this, I, I it just came back to mind. So there's this yeah. thing that I heard called fortressing that Domino's was doing. So the idea was to like saturate regions with of the, of their priority with as many Domino's locations as they could. Um, I found some uh, literature on this and some quotes from the CEO of Domino's. And um, so post COVID, they led. Uh, this strategy, it led to a 35% year over year increase in carryout sales. And then they also found that there's only 15% overlap uh, between pickup customers and carryout customers. Um, so I'm just curious what you think about this fortressing strategy as, as, a, as a means like locations being part of the physical availability. I think in terms of retailing, what... Um the research says there's also that first store loyalty, right? So, you know, you go to the supermarket closest to you. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, in, in Domino's case, it, it was quite smart in a way. Well, I, it, I, I would question that. I would ask about their profitability or the cost, you know, the investment needed to, to establish that many stores mm -hmm. within one geographic, ge geographical area. Mm -hmm. But in terms of presence, it, it was, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say that it's a sensible move to, to really put so many stores within the area with hopefully as little mm -hmm. overlap as possible or within the expected level of overlap mm -hmm. so that consumers, wherever they live, 
would would think, uh, yep, there's a domino close, a uh, domino store nearby, rather than drive, you know, three miles or three kilos out of town just to find sort of like KFC or any other um, yeah. competitors in terms of pizza brands. Mm-hmm. Didn't Mark you uh, you may remember this, but I think Starbucks did a very similar strategy where they tried to put two locations for every Tim Hortons here in Canada in a very small proximity. Mm-hmm. I think for for a very similar reason. Um, I think at some point the, that was scaled back as as they were able to achieve maybe um, you know um, market dominance, I, I suppose. But I thought that when I when I saw the Domino's case, I know Starbucks has used a very similar yep. strategy as well. Mm-hmm. And I think in a way, like what we know from from research is that consumers are inherently sort of like cognitive mises. We just don't want to think too much about brands. No. We just don't want to exert much more um, sort of like energy or uh, than necessary to purchase coffee or or pizza. Mm-hmm. Anything that makes it make things easy yeah. um, would be appreciated by consumers. Yeah, especially well, I, in I, a category like that with pizza, where it's like it's you never really have bad pizza. <laughs> like, <laughs> pizza's pizza. <laughs> For the most well, part, if you have good pizza, you remember where you had bad pizza. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, even the worst pizza is still pretty good. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you know, look, when you, when you want cold pizza in the, mo- in the morning after as well, any kind of brands, right? Yeah. Uh, just going back to the Domino's case study, sure. the, there's that, like they said that there was a really small overlap, 15% overlap between pickup customers and carryout customers. Based on the work that you've done, Do you, I I know you may not know the exact answer, but do you have any ideas on how to rationalize that or explain that? It seems strange to me that there would be a difference. Look, it could be, we haven't really sort of like uh, taken a deep dive into sort of like pizza consumption or like delivery uh, uh, versus dining consumers. But technically, in terms of overlap across channels, across brands, uh, we can um, sort of like uh, take a leaf out of the duplication of purchase law, mm-hmm. right? So in terms of for duplication of purchase law, competing brands would share buyers, i.e. buyer overlap, mm-hmm. um, in line with their size in the market. Mm-hmm. Like brands, um, they are really, really popular. Um you know, it's the smaller brands would share more buyers with the bigger brands rather than the smaller brands. Mm-hmm. And so this has also been found to be true for channels. And so, you know, hmm. based on duplication of purchase law, we know the expected level of sharing. Um, and then the excess, excessive level of sharing would be considered as cannibalization. Hmm. So, but without without real data on a 15 percent um overlap in in dominoes that yeah um we'd have to look at the the raw data Mm -hmm. so is that like just taking what you said and trying to understand a bit better is that to say that there may be um pickup customers is a one channel for for sales and carry out customers uh or sorry and carry out is a separate channel yep and so they, even though it's the same store, they may not have the same customer base for yeah, each of well, the services. Yes. Correct, correct. So in a way, you know, it, it, sort of like if we, so some consumers would go there and they're like, look, we'll just dine in. Some people, some consumers would be happy just sort of like purchase the pizza and then just take them home, right? The same mm-hmm. with banks, for example. Mm-hmm. Some people would would want to go to the branch um, have a chat with the tellers. I know it's getting yeah. rare these days, but some consumers mm-hmm. would, would be happy just to use a phone or to online. basically online. And then although they are, there would be distinct groups within the three, but there would be overlap. And then this degree of overlaps will be governed by the duplication of purchase law. Hmm. Fascinating. So yeah, we, and we, and all of this is again, it's it's within the domains of you know um, all of this research that was done years and years ago before the you know the uh, the advent of the internet and online purchasing by Ehrenberg 
and his colleagues way back when in the 60s. Yeah. Yeah, there's, V and I have talked about this before. I have, um, where is it? I'm just looking for the book. <laughs> but it's Ogilvy's <laughs> book. But they, he keeps talking about Aaron, Andrew Ehrenberg in Ogilvy's book. And I don't remember when yeah. that was written, but yeah. Yeah. So question for you. We, we touched a little bit on online and, and, and whatnot, but do you believe like with so many consumers now shifting a lot of their behaviors to online shopping and, you know, making it, it's accessible, it's easier, Amazon prime, all of that. It, it just makes, it reduces that friction again, like, like we were talking about earlier. Um, yes. Do you see that as a means of increasing physical availability? Oh, definitely. Definitely. So it, it, Again, any ways to make things easy for consumers to access the products would benefit the brand. Uh, and so I think, it, it, but we need to also see this in perspective because at the moment, consumers are still happy to purchase from physical stores. Right. Um, and then there are some limitations to selling things online. And so when brands kind of, shift their focus too much to online and abandon sort of like the, the physical stores or physical distribution or establishing presence in the market, that that's really a dangerous move because mm-hmm. by and large, whether you're in the US or Canada or Australia, uh, you know, or China even, or, or South Korea, where there is a massive portion of consumers who are purchased online, um, the main channel is still offline. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now my turn for a quick little story as that triggered a thought. So (laughs) going back to like the Best Buy example, Best Buy was always like this place for everybody. Like you needed an HDMI cable, you needed a dongle, you need whatever. It was like where you would go pick one up. But then they they started creating like this um, endless aisle style of idea, especially through their e-commerce platforms where they're bringing in more partners and they started limiting the inventory in store. Yep. It got to the point where you would go in store and they would say, oh, we don't have it here, but we can get it for you online. That for me, from a consumer perspective, is very irritating because like, yes. I took time out of my day to walk into your store to pick up this product. And you tell me I, I need to go online instead. So I think that's <laughs> where there's, there's another line here where it's like, well, we have to be careful like why e-commerce does allow for this endless aisle, so many more products. If a consumer has built a behavior of using your store as being that first touch for something, let's use this case like a peripheral from from a computer perspective, you're now introducing barriers. And that's Correct. where I have not gone back to Best Buy, to be honest, because that happened a couple of times. I'm like, I'm done with this. I'm not I'm not ever going to Best Buy again because I don't want to be told I need to go find it online. Because I'm in the store yeah. for a reason. I, yeah, I can see that as well. So it's like if you look if you put so many hoops in front of me just to purchase you, I'll buy your your competitor who would make it make things easier for me. Thank you very much. Exactly. So, in that case, for Best Buy or any other brands that that do this, should they be thinking about their ecom platform as an extension of their store or their complementary? They're and so you're trying to grow market share on both, like. Are they, as V and I both had this shared experience where there's also complaints within the organization that we used to work with where e com is stealing sales from from web or from the store. And so, you know, there's questions around who gets credit for that and all that kind of thing. But yes. is there, like, what's the right way to approach that for an organization? It would be looking into the context of the category first right so looking into and then looking at the layout of the land like how would consumers choose to purchase a certain category like for snacking for example i would be predominantly offline purchases yeah but yeah. say for computer um peripherals and and you know um equipments Perhaps it's shifting more towards online as well. So <laughs> looking at the layout of land, how consumers purchase um, the category would be important. And then make decisions based on that. Because I think forcing consumers to, when they go to stores and say, you need to go online to make the purchase, mm-hmm. or vice versa, right. is not really helpful. I mean, 
I think this is why the old mantra of consumer centric, where right, it was big in the nineties and two thousands, I think needs to be seen. It need, needs to be applied as well in the way that consumers purchase. Right. It's just, it's, it's a good don't point. try to change how consumers buy, but like, look, look at the layout of the land, but of course, mm take a pulse every so many years and say, has it changed? And then make that investment accordingly. If people continue, you know, more and more purchase online, then perhaps we should ramp up the, the investment online as well to make things easy for consumers to to make that that sale. Yeah. And then get out of the way when somebody <laughs> somebody says, well, that was my sale. Or that. Like that's internal politics, really, by the sounds of it. Exactly. That, that just doesn't really need to be there. Exactly. So it, it, in a way, it's it's almost like the, you know, the internal KPIs and the internal machination that need to be dealt with by the management. But for consumers, yeah. technically, we don't care, <laughs> right? Care. Like, they don't yeah. care. It's like, I need to buy that computer from Best Buy, or I need to buy that brand of skincare or shampoo. Right. I don't <laughs> care how you, how you sort of like apportion, like, you know, the KPI of the sales. Right. Um, just to extend that idea around online, um, there's been a bunch of conversations that we've had and been a part of, uh, where people talk about, um, digital ads, let's say like yep. a paid search ad as an example, or, a, a Facebook, uh, product listing ads retargeting people, um, as being f more like physical signage than actually an ad. And so given that we t just talked about an e-com store being a, yeah. st a physical asset that brands can, can build. What's your take on the extension of that, which is advertising. Do you see that as advertising? Like some of those examples I talked about, or are those kinds of what we would historically call ads? Are they more like signage? I would, I would agree with that. And again, it, it's within the domains of, online shopping or e-commerce this is where it's exciting it's exciting and interesting for 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 me and for my fellow researchers at the Edinburgh Best Institute because it's almost like a true intersection of physical and mental availability all in one go right mm -hmm. so you can basically look at the ad on Facebook or see a, uh, a banner ad and then click on that and then make a purchase so mm -hmm. in a way it's almost like mental and physical availability so like happening it's almost like simultaneously right so um you know there are i know i'm digressing here but there's there's also a a, a research at the Embrick bass institute where basically putting things on the end caps in supermarket mm -hmm. actually acts more like an advertising for for people to remind buyers and say hey you need to buy packet of chips or mm. uh, you know some 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 jam so actually the increase in sales happened to be in the aisle not in the, the, in end, the end cap, cap. Huh. yeah so oh, in, in a way it's it parallel to this because like if you put an ad as, as yeah. especially if you make things easy for consumers again it, it's physical and mental availability happening at, at almost simultaneously <sighs> This this conversation is like, it, it's insane because like my mind is now, I was in the grocery store yesterday. So you're talking about the end caps where they're advertising more chips. So you didn't say you got through walking the chip lane. You're like, I'm not buying any of it. No problem. <laughs> On your way to milk. Good for there's you. End cap. Thanks, man. <laughs> On your way to buy milk. There's so many end caps that are reminded. Remember, you need some chips. How about, how about these chips? <laughs> and even if you get through the end caps, then there's the impulse lane. So yeah. when you're paying and you're sitting there waiting to pay, they're the, the stupid chips once or more. I'd be like serving as reminders. So anyways. I've done that. Out. I've done that too. Like <laughs> I'm trying to cut down my sugar, but hey, you need that extra, you know, like, oh God, it's, it's, it's on special $1. Like, okay, why not? <laughs> yeah. Did, I'm wondering, like in a B2B sense, I know we, we hadn't sort of prepped on any of this stuff, but I'm just wondering, is yeah. it, does it a apply in, in the same way like you cpg i get and grocery retail all that kind of stuff i get that but do you don't often have like a store for b2b services you might have a website for say i don't know SaaS product or something like that or anything yeah. really but is it is it the same thing 
Yes, I would. I would. Yeah, I, you know, I in preparation for this conversation, I also thought about how it would apply to SaaS and B two B, and I think it, it's ensuring that the solution would work in any platform, whether you know that the the product is. Uh, you know, OS agnostic mm. uh, would work in the US as well as in, in Australia mm-hmm. and in Europe as well. Uh, would work under different platforms. Um, and so regardless of how consumers choose to interact with, with the mm. company. Uh, um, and because I have been frustrated sometimes when I uh, want to engage with, with, with a brand and they said, and, and on the contact me page, there was no phone number mm-hmm. or like, it sort of like forces me to fill out a form where I think I would love to sort of like write an email or, you know, or basically yeah. just, just do whatever to make things easy for, for me to engage with you. Um, or for example, um, purchase a software and it says, or oh, it only works in certain mm, OS, not yeah, in the other. Yeah. yeah. Or this morning when I talked to Siri and said, uh, you know, send me, send a Slack message to, to my colleague saying I'll be five minutes late. And Siri says, sorry, can't do that because there is no connection between Siri and Slack. Oh, yeah. You know, and, you know, physical availability goes beyond just merely talking about tangible goods. Yeah. But also works in B2B, in SaaS, um, and in online purchases as well. It's, as you were just describing some of those scenarios, I was thinking in Canada we've got. Uh, I, you know, I was I, I was going to say ten, but I'm not even sure how many provinces we have in. <laughs> but there's one province that's French, and so there's specific laws around how much French language and how much English language, and you know yeah. all that kind of stuff. And so oftentimes, and their rules are different. And so in so, a lot of ways, it, you would almost have to treat that Quebec uh, province as a separate country as though like yeah. the laws and the tax laws and things like in language laws um and so i know that that is limiting for a lot of organizations because there's hurdles to get over from an organizational point of view to be able to operate within that that province yeah and again it, it's it's all this in, in if you're in a b2b relationship or you know in terms of you know um providing goods or services. Um, sometimes, again, it, it, in parallel to CPG and other tangible goods, it's just like companies often make things harder for consumers to engage or make the purchase with them. Yeah. Technically, if you're still a small brand in B2B or SaaS, then you basically need to ensure that within the confine of the ge- geographic area or the service that you, you, um, you operate in, then you maximize your mental and physical availability. If you can only operate in, say, Quebec or Ontario or a particular mm-hmm. state in the in the U.S., then make sure that you can you can deliver your, a, a good service to those geographic area, and don't sort of like expand necessarily for the sake of expansion without taking care of the mental and physical availability. Hmm. It's like if you want to operate in the whole Canada, for example, you have to. Also, I would assume to operate in English as well as French. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and probably in the States, it's, you know, you might have Spanish and English in, in a lot yeah. of places. Yeah. Yeah. Or other countries. I know there's like Germany. I think they speak a few different languages. And Switzerland definitely yeah. has a few different languages. I'm not sure about Australia. But even within the country, you have all these. Yeah. Yeah, and then again, it's 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 like sometimes when you go to a hosting company, for example, and then um, and then you try to contact them, and then they said, "Sorry, we only you know our uh, helpline only w- opens from eight a.m. to ten p.m. Pacific time." It's mm-hmm. like, but I don't live in California. Yeah, like I need to have that sort of like help right away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's and interesting. then so yeah, this is why I think companies and when they sort of like oh let's go online let's us offer services online well there are a lot of other um considerations when you choose a particular uh, geographic area or particular channel yeah like you need to take care of those Hmm. go ahead v no no go i was just gonna i was just gonna say it's fascinating because like it goes back to like there's 
naturally there's always going to be barriers just going to market right yep and i think when we we think about the the role of the marketer is reducing that friction to purchase as much as possible and then Correct. when you're adding the complexities of say the regionalization but then also the hurdles we put in front of ourselves sometimes for consumers it just creates this compounding effect sometimes that just makes us inefficient and there's already difficulties that we're dealing with so how do we make sure that we're you know, when we think in the, in the idea of like physical availability, how do we make sure that we make that as easy as possible for our products or services that were top of mind, easily accessible and, and whatnot? So, yeah, it wasn't really a question. It was just more of like, we're already make it's already hard. Let's not make it harder. <laughs> it is, but again, I, I think I see the role of physical availability is to basically do a harvest of all of the hard work that you yeah. that the brand has done the company has done in cultivating mental availability It's basically yeah. you know it's almost like the last jump before before you reach the goal mm -hmm. right so and then just make things easy for consumers to make that jump because sometimes yeah. you know i've seen the ad yes i want to buy and then <laughs> at the point of purchase like sorry we don't serve consumers in australia it's yeah. only in the us it's like oh mm -hmm. come on yeah like I, I am ready to make that purchase yeah or we don't have the 16 inch version. We have the 14. <laughs> or the, but right. it's on the leasing or plan that you it's want. Not, it. Actually, it's not in store. Our stock count is wrong, but you can go back <laughs> online and pre order if you like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. It, so in, it, we talked, I would say the last little bit around that was around presence. And then I wanted to ask about some questions around relevance, similar to that 16 versus a 14 inch monitor. Yep. But let's use a different product. Uh, to talk about this. So Starbucks, um, it's really interesting Think like it, this whole, my, my view of what a, a physical amount of availability is, is totally changed since prepping for this interview and chatting with you about it. Cause and thinking about relevance, like the product range, yeah. um, matters a lot. And so there's barriers within just the products that you offer. Like we could say, yeah, Starbucks is coffee, but it's not just coffee. It's like specific kinds of coffee. There's maybe just yeah. talk about some of that if you don't mind. Look, it's, it's, it's true. Cause like Dunkin, Dunkin Donuts drop donuts, right? Right. It's just, just Dunkin. Right. Now you go there for coffee, Starbucks coffee, drop coffee. So you can go there for any kinds of, you know, well, within within reason uh types of food or snacks that you want to buy and so i think it it it's it's but it uh, providing a portfolio of products that are relevant to the consumers in their particular consumption occasion right mm -hmm. so but again it it of course when you choose to provide more portfolio options and there are also other equations that you need to consider like you know the investment, the the um, and also the processes, etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But of course, you know, like providing relevant options for consumers would would be great um, within that particular product category. Like if you're managing a, a brand of shampoo, um, providing options for different types of hair, uh, different lengths, different color, yada yada yada, mm -hmm. a different um, you know fragrance as well would be helpful because again it, it allows consumers to make a choice within your own range mm -hmm. but again enlarging that range willy-nilly without much consideration or strategic intent is also dangerous right because technically it uh, allows your cost to sort of like balloon and also with duplication of purchase law also um mm. it is in play here so that you would not want your sibling products to cannibalize each other above the expected um sort of like rate yeah and so of course when you you when when you're in charge of a, a brand or a business providing options that are relevant to consumers is important but there would be you know um consequences i guess mm -hmm. um, when you choose to sort of like tackle more more product options i mean a little anecdote here as well like in Indonesia, where I I was from, um, my when I went there recently, my my sisters are like, let's go to KFC for coffee. I like KFC for coffee, mm -hmm. but apparently in Indonesia, coffee like it, they also provide. 
coffee and it's quite popular among the locals. So go figure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the same with salad with McDonald's, I guess. Now yeah. it's, it's, it's norm. Actually, I had a similar experience. So I'm of Greek descent. So anytime we go back to Greece, um, you know, with a family, it's, all, it's always a treat. But um, Pizza Hut uh, in Greece was more of a dining experience versus here in North America, where it's just carry out, take out uh, primarily. But it was like proper dining, like there was tablecloths on the table. And it was like, <laughs> it was a Pizza Hut that like, you were like, am I actually in a Pizza Hut? What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> it was... It was a totally different experience, but uh, yeah, it was something like obviously from a, they were able to cater to something to a local to a local yeah. uh, audience that that worked. So yeah, that was, yeah. and I guess this is related to what I said earlier, knowing the layout of the land, like how yeah. people to consume a certain category. Yeah, and just going back to that Starbucks thing, like so yeah starbucks is coffee but you can get drip you can express so if i'm in the grocery yeah. store then you can also get pods you can get instant yeah. coffee like the the dried stuff if you're in a grocery store they've got cans and bottles of prepackaged things so and then there's all kinds of price points if then within the store you can do the tap you can pre-order you can use your phone or your watch and so it's it like that's why it's blowing my mind right now because there is so much that goes into it making products more available. It's not just we'll put up a store and have a cash no. register. There's yep. there's so much that happens in so many ways you can reduce friction. It's it's fascinating. And in a way, what it's what they've done quite smartly is ensuring that the logo stays consistent. Um, you know, totally. the, the distinctive assets stay consistent across because at least for those who have their first exposure to the brand through the cafes, when they go to the grocery store, they say like, ah, yeah, I recognize that brand. Now yeah. I can have, you know, the coffee uh, with a quality similar to the ones that I have in, co in cafes at home. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, whatever, you know, however I choose to interact with the brand, now the brand offers that for me. Yeah. And you almost, you talked about like how originally the Starbucks coffee now, re, if you want to call it a rebrand, but like the, it's just more Starbucks and, and whatnot. You can, you can almost see the, as the mental availability for their products grew, the line extensions started happening. So you're talking about like the homebrew, you're talking about like the, the accessibility of the product outside of just the, the actual storefronts, which served essentially as the, the original kind of um, experience consumers came to, to love and, and, and appreciate. But it, as the com com company continued to mature and grow, the line extensions happen. So I wonder if there's a way that, you know, as you, as you kind of pace your, your organization across this infinite timeline of the right point in time where you're introducing these extensions to enhance both the physical availability of the product, but while maintaining the mental availability that you've already built upon through brand exercises. I see that point in parallel with the research um, that I did at, at the Institute that, bigger brands tend to have bigger portfolio. Yeah. And so I guess into the parallel would be with with um, you know a big brand like Starbucks and yes they would they would offer more options and more um, choices for consumers. Right. But I would also temper that with sort of like okay, but would the company have the capacity uh, uh, the infrastructure in place? to support that extension, right? Because there's always a danger and say, let's offer more options for consumers because consumers love being in Starbucks cafe or, mm -hmm. you know, would purchase the brand. Let's put, you know, more categories in it. But of course, with extra choice of category, similar um, to the decision in adding a country or region or state right. or province as part of the physical availability, there would be consequences. And yeah. then if the company is not ready for that, then, you know, consumers say, That's like, say, point. for example, if, if Starbucks suddenly say, let's offer yogurt and the quality is subpar to their coffee, consumers will say, you know. That damages bad. the original coffee. Exactly. Brand. Yeah. Exactly yeah, right. What about things like, and this maybe is, I don't know how much research you've done into this, but just a, a, 
an extension of that idea around line extensions. Like I keep thinking about Porsche Carrera and seeing them on like watches and glasses Mm -hmm. and like sunglasses and things like that. Does that fall in the same category of, of like, if it's helpful, the brand, okay, as long as your company can support it or, or how does that work in your mind? Yeah, I can't really comment on that because I think, you know, with the absence of like the data behind it, I just really don't know whether it would help or not. Like some years ago, uh, Mercedes-Benz um, released a, a series of mixtapes. Mm. And, you know, it, it's not related to the car, but apparently uh, the music would would sound great if you play it in the Mercedes-Benz car but I don't drive a Mercedes Mm -hmm. and you know, those kind of things sometimes, you know, um, I guess marketers also think too much far ahead Mm -hmm. in terms of like trying to create sort of like some kind of, uh, a domain or habitat for all these little things that would support a brand, but maybe, you know, with, with dubious links, so there is no evidence. So yeah, not too sure about that. Cause yeah, yeah, like in effect, like some some um, some brands would, you know, like Mont Blanc, for example, operates in fragrances, but also operate in sort of like pens, fancy right. pens. But maybe uh, the consumers who uh, who sort of like interact with the brand in one category are separate to those who interact in the other category. Right, right. With no real understanding of the whole um brand infrastructure yeah yeah so yeah the jury's still out (laughs) yeah fair enough fair enough um in terms of uh, there's another one of the other sections that is forms the the basis of mental or sorry physical availability is prominence uh and we we touched on this a little bit before about the bag of chips and and your hair product but there's a classic (laughs) case study about tropicana yes uh and i just wonder if you can comment on that a little bit because it to me sounds like it's well documented that it tanks sales horribly when they did a rebrand and just wonder if you could kind of use that as a example to talk about prominence in in terms of prominence like of course you you know marketers still have that freedom to operate within within the confines of of you know the brand's distinctive assets but again it it relies on on marketers knowing what what distinctive assets that need to be protected mm-hmm. the non-negotiables and what are the things that that they can still play around with right and if they choose to repackage change the distinctive assets over time for example due to some reasons they need to do it really really carefully so that mm-hmm. all of this, this shortcuts that consumers have with the brand are not severed or affected in any way. Mm-hmm. Like you, in your example of the pack of chips, if they want, you know, for some reasons they want to change from black and white to blue, they could change it gradually, perhaps. Uh, but again, it, it, it's sort of like prominence is, is really um, important in, in physical availability because it, it allows it, it serves as a, that shortcut between the consumers mm-hmm. um, to the brand. And so there, there may be a lot of reasons why certain packaging has changed or rebranding or uh, logo change. It's because the, the marketers feel bored um, because of, you know, certain need to modernize the brand. Like my colleagues mm-hmm. at the Institute is actually going to release a, a report on this packaging modernization so whether it's it's um necessary or not so <laughs> i mean prominent in terms of, you know back again to your question like prominence is it's it's something that marketers would need re- to think really carefully um because again in the consumer's mind they don't care whether it, it's the, the brand is it, it looks modern or not if it serves the, the purpose and there is a, a a mental availability in their mind to purchase the brand let's protect that Mm-hmm. And if if some modernization needs to be done, or for example, some changes to the pack needs to be done due to legislations, for example, right. then it needs to be managed carefully. Yeah, like something like Aunt Jemima, I think is a great example where you're you're going through that process, but you're doing it for the right reasons. 
Yeah. Um, which I think even consumers can, can get behind. Um, quick question here for you. So obviously you've probably seen this as well. I'm, I'm sure it's in, it's prominent in Australia as well, but there's been a big trend towards pop-up brand experiences, shop and shops, even like portable food truck uh, type activations. And I think we can all understand why, you know, a lot of brands are going down that, uh, that road to increase again, the accessibility of their products, services, et cetera. Um, we know that innately there is this desire to really be different, be a little bit crazy, you know, think outside the box, if you, if you will. And really in an effort to really kind of stand out from the clutter or like the competition, what, what are your thoughts on that? And those extensions, if you will, uh, into those, uh, those types of areas. I would say again, it's uh, yeah, that, that, the, the drive to sort of like disrupt the market to be different. And again, mm-hmm. um, we need to think that the context of the con- consumption, there is the majority of light category buyers pro- are probably oblivious to these techniques, right? Yeah, so for example, if, if you consume the product a lot, then you would be more attuned to all these new and strange things that are appearing in the market. If I drink coffee a lot, then I would notice all these new strange things that appear for example or um if there's a pop-up uh, pop-up truck or uh, a pop-up shop for certain coffee brands because i'm a heavy category buyer i would be interested right. in that but if you don't drink coffee a lot then you may not be attracted to all to this tactics and then sure. when the the campaign stops and they go to the stores to supermarkets grocery stores to make their purchase Probably they would, um, you know, go to the big brands. They're widely available, and it, it sort of like registers in their mind. So yeah, all if I think marketers also need to remember that um, it's a light category buyers. There are millions, millions of them That's a good that point. need to be won over. Yeah, along that line, um, have you from a perspective of physical availability then how do you how do you treat or how do you know if you're undersaturated in a market how do you know if you're oversaturated in a market like where where do you hit the gas and where do you push pump the brakes (laughs) i guess the 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 exciting (laughs) thing is like you you need to continue we we need to continue moving right so we need to sort of like ensure even for big brands penetration still matters um, because, um, you know, we need to ensure that our buyers continue to buy and our lapse buyers can, uh, would con- reconsider the brand. So one of the things that we can look at is also how the category penetration in the market, right? So, for example, in terms of things like shampoo or, or uh, soap, you probably saturate, we, you know, in terms of category consumption, it's saturated already. So growth needs to be achieved through other other means, but for other categories, there's still like, I would argue like coffee pods as a subcategory probably still have some room to grow because mm. there would be some consumers out there who would happily consume instant coffee and they haven't experienced right. um, or tasted pot coffee. Um, so it it, but I would say yes, each this this different type of maturity would also require different kind of strategies, mm-hmm. but whatever, whatever sort of like market maturity penetration is still really important. And or but, maintaining or growing penetration, yeah. which means requiring more customers, more new customers. Yes. Or, uh, um, acquiring more, uh, or main, t- you know, basically in terms of, uh, to get as many um, category buyers as possible mm-hmm. to p- also purchase your brand, um, and then also to consider not just not just to take care of your heavy brand buyers, but also think about all right. those lapse buyers. Like you know, if if you buy coffee pods, not just your those who subscribe to Nespresso's. Um, if if you manage Nespresso, for example, not to just take care of your those who subscribe, but also think of those who may not have made any purchase in the last five to ten years, but they did in the past. 
um, because they still mm -hmm. may, they still probably buy copy pods, but not just not your brand. So you know, uh, mm -hmm. think about everything in the in the category context is really important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm just trying to figure. Yeah, I like. I, I know. I know we're getting close on time here, and I want to be very purposeful with uh, with the questions that you know that we have. But like, my mind is racing with everything that you're saying, Ari, and it's. Um, I can't help to think of like personal experiences. But anyways, we'll leave that aside for now. So let's say you're a QSR organization, and you had the opportunity to produce and sell your own private label. Now, is there evidence to guide a decision into invest in selling your own stores versus reaching out, say, to the larger distribution distributions like uh, grocery stores instead that makes it, I don't know if it's more profitable, but helps you gain larger markets or quicker, uh, quicker. Is that even, what am I talking about? Quickly, <laughs> or quickly, but quicker. I think that those those type of decisions, again, I would I would get back to the, the framework of, um, doing the thing that you can do really well, right? So like within a specific um, region or, or sort of like distribution channel. Like if you have all of your infrastructure ready, um, you know, within your own store, and then if you want to approach a particular distributor or grocery store or, or department store, uh, they make sure that you can also service that, that relationship oh. well and mm -hmm. ensuring that your consumer can have a similar experience, whether they go to your own store or sort of like to the, to or through the distributors. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, again, anecdotally, um, some brands really sort of like don't, especially marketers, don't look at this in a holistic view. It's like, yep, we've done the campaign, um, right. we've done the creative, that's it. But actually, our our role is much bigger than that. Yeah. Sorry, one one thing there, Mark. Just yeah, so go for when, it. When I'm think when I'm thinking about this right now, there could be a lot of products that would say, you know, what getting into a Walmart would be our dream, right? Yes. But they could get into a Walmart, but if they haven't been able to build that mental availability, even though they may have distribution, it yep. still may falter. So, like, I see the tie between these two things so being so um, so close. 100%. And like, it's it's just like the aim is like, let's go to Walmart. Well, are we, yeah. are we ready for Walmart? Like, exactly. And then say, yeah, let's go to Walmart. And then Walmart kind of says, okay, because you're you're still a small brand, we'll put you at the, at, at, at the bottom shelf. Totally. And, and you're not getting is, the end cap. Exactly. <laughs> you're yeah. not going to get end cap. Yeah. And your rate of sales kind of slow down of, over time. And yeah. then Walmart kind of like, we're going to delist you because we're not selling your product. Yeah, and so it, it, again, it you know before you, the the brand embarks on a new geographic area channel, whatever through physical, uh, you know, in terms of physical availability, like it entails a lot of important decisions. Yeah, yeah, the, it's funny because I just this sounds so stupid, and it sound it's probably so obvious to people who work in a store, but yeah. placement, like you, you know, being people we have legs most of the time and that means we're probably standing so high and so but shelves often are at the like where our feet are <laughs> and your eyes aren't where your feet are all the time unless you, <laughs> you drop something or you've got a kid you're chasing after and so like the mental availability part helps the physical availability part and vice versa so that people know where to look for it even though it might be in front of you it's not necessarily at your eye level Exactly. And I think that's why I, I, I personally see the the beauty of this framework is that actually it brings marketing and sales together yeah. um, and distribution like together. It's like in the past, through personal experience as well, they, you know, the, the two departments were at some point in time quite disjointed, right? Totally. Marketing will do all of the strategic thinking. The, the salespeople would do all of the d delivery and distribution. <clears throat> and now with with physical and mental availability, these two areas need to work together really closely because mm -hmm. marketers need to know how well the products are distributed and where they are in store um, and the look and feel as well. And the, the sales team would need to know as well in terms of 
are the products well supported in terms of advertising or not? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, they would fight to have the best shelf location, the, the end caps, the gondola, whatever. Mm -hmm. If they're not supported by advertising, then you know it could be a futile exercise. Yeah. Hey, uh, there's this other note we have in here, but I, I suspect the answer is yes. So the <laughs> the question is that like, does this apply to startups as well? And I feel like it may be actually even more important for startups to work on their mental and physical availability. Yes. That's often, I would imagine what is a huge complication where big companies got big because they worked out a lot of those details. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So for startups, again, focus on the areas that you can serve well in terms of mental and physical availability. Like if, you know, just, just, trying to create to, to think of a, a simple exercise a, a simple example like if i have a, a dog walking business like make sure that i cover the suburb well in terms of flyers in terms of building mental availability and physical availability in that particular suburb mm -hmm. don't don't try to attempt to tackle the whole metropolitan area mm -hmm. uh, because again i will not be able to serve the consumer as well mm -hmm. the same with startups as well like usually when when the startup is established in the u.s they're like oh let's let's go to china and like hang on a yeah, minute yeah. we don't have the that's the kind of a big place <laughs> exactly <laughs> You know, like <laughs> take care of your mental and physical availability first, do it well. And then if you have the right infrastructure, it's, um, then by all means. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, you stumped us a few times. You made a speech list yeah. a couple of times. So uh, <laughs> maybe you can do it again. Good list. <laughs> yeah. Can you, how do people find out more about you and the work you're doing, Ari? Um, so our website is www.marketingscience.info. So the Aaron Rick Bass Institute, um, and I think we're the world largest research center into marketing based here in good old Adelaide, uh, where life is good and the wines are great. So. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like a tourism ad, Ari. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, look, look it, it's like if you can drink wine and do great research, why not? Yeah, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. I'm in. <laughs> are you hiring? <laughs> this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and also I, um, something that that's coming. We also have uh, how brands grow for executives. For executives. Yes, I heard so that, yeah. that is uh, sort of like uh, uh, intense, but I it, but insightful. Four days um, in either Singapore, the US, or in France, where executives can sort of like learn more about how brands grow. Um, direct from uh, the director himself, Professor Byron Chow. Yeah, that's great. I just a quick anecdote about that. Like, I was in a conversation the other day about um, an education program, business school education, and so I yes. was bringing up some of the stuff that we've been talking about today. And they're like, "Yeah, but you got to remember, these are junior people that are coming into the workforce, and we're just trying to prep them for the work that they're doing right now." And and it occurred to me that that is so important to have an executive level education because they're the ones that can see it's like a generalization, not a specialization. Yeah. Yep. And they're the ones that are looking for the forest through the trees. <laughs> Correct. And I think I could just imagine the frustration of, of, um, you know, bright, um, you know, upcoming marketers from, um, the Institute, uh, where they work in organizations where the top kind of says, no, 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 yeah. let's, let's think about segmentation and, and targeting, narrow targeting. Yeah. And like after a while, totally. you know, they have to buckle yeah. because it, they want a no, <laughs> they're direct from the top. Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. This was great, Ari. This was great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Just before we get to the post pod with V and I, I'm going to just ask to see if you could leave a review. We are always looking for ways to make this show better and really love your feedback. Hey, V. Post pod. Post pod. There it is. <laughs> I got to do a better voice there. 
<laughs> and so now funny. it's time for the post pod with V and Mark. There it is. I was trying to I do a radio that. thing there. What do you think? I think you do that. You naturally have this amazing radio voice. Yeah, I've told right. You that before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what did wh- Ari? Easy to mind, easy to find. Yeah. If I had to, if I had to summarize our conversation with him, I think that's what it comes down to. It was mm-hmm. you. T- you talked about this during the episode, but we have not had talked to anybody really about mental and physical, fail- yeah. especially physical availability in this capacity. Yeah. And uh, I know before we we hit record here we were just kind of sharing like all the different stories that start coming to mind. The moment you start applying that lens and it's like, Oh yeah, this is why mm-hmm. this product no longer exists. Or this is what they're doing to me in the supermarket where they forcing me to buy, you know, chips because they're putting it everywhere for me to, to potentially, you know, constantly have that conversation in my head. But mm-hmm. I think it's such an under, um, not understated, under communicated somehow something we lose sight on as marketers, mm-hmm. just the importance of this mm-hmm. because it doesn't matter how great your marketing is. If it's not available, physically available, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, I, you know, what I think the difference is between having conversations about the mental side versus the physical side is that we've all, we all can touch and feel the products. Totally. Right. Like we've all gone shopping for something and we've all had that experience where like I'm trying to buy something, but if they don't have it in my size, you know, I could buy it online, but what a pain in the butt. There's a store across, <laughs> the, across the hall that's got something similar, like, or the exact same thing. And, and so we've all had that experience. Uh, and so I think the ideas of the laws of marketing actually become more tangible when you talk about the physical availability side, whereas it's harder on the mental availability side, because a lot of stuff we're talking about is happening inside of people's brains and you can't see it happening. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. And I think it's the physical availability part is what makes everyone an expert in advertising. Yeah. Because you, you go through that process of physically searching or finding that product and that innately as consumers makes us the focus groups of one, if you will, well, this Mm -hmm. worked on me this worked on someone else, right? Yeah. And it allows us to create those opinions that often are somewhat myopic, I guess you would consider, but sure. because it is so tangible, it is, um, it's the easiest thing that you can, you can kind of go back on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, um, the other one, like going back to the Starbucks example, it honestly was, <clears throat> I, I, <sighs> It was really, I think I said mind blowing before. I'll stick with that word. It was mind, or combo, what is that? A compound word? I don't know what that is. Anyway. Uh, well, <laughs> like, where are we going word? with this? <laughs> I think it's hyphenated. Where but is it? It's just yeah. like, yeah, it's Starbucks. I think of it as coffee. And then yes. secondarily, like some snacks and maybe some sandwiches and stuff like that. Maybe some breakfast stuff. But, yeah. but primarily coffee. And then when you start thinking about all the kinds of products that they have within a single store yeah like there's the drip coffee there's the i was looking it up uh for some research there's a custom coffee that somebody made that's 178 bucks from a starbucks (laughs) (laughs) what (laughs) it's insane there's yeah there's okay i'll put a link into it i don't know how they did it but it had something like 78 shots of espresso (laughs) i'm just trying to look (laughs) for my notes yeah, 170 special shots in a drink. It had it was 178 bucks. Is it and called you, a kill shot? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it had a word, it had a name and everything too. But like okay. But yeah, so you've got customization that can happen. You've got the drip coffee, you've got all the lattes, you've got all the other kinds of drinks that they have there. Plus then yeah. you've got like the bags of coffee ground or not ground in the whole bean form. Um, merchandise merchandise yeah like and then you go to a like the grocery store and starbucks stuff is there they got all different flavors of pods they got all the instant then you go to a grocery or a corner store and they've got five or six different kinds of starbucks drinks it's kind of fascinating when you think about where starbucks is it's not just the store and it's also your app right like 
a whole bunch of people have that on the wrap. They pre-order and they never have to wait in line when they go to the store. Like all those things work together to make it easier for a company or a customer to buy. Well, I would argue the if you do physically physical availability right, it helps continuously to build mental availability. Totally. Totally. Because it's kind of like the, uh, I think Mary told us about this, where a brand's equity is 25% the ads and 75% the experience. Yes. yes. So physical availability has a huge component of building that mental availability that people have because it's stickier. Like once you use something, you have a better recall, more concrete memories of it. Yep. And the ad, I think ads at the end of the day, just help with recall more than anything. Mm. Right. If, if we go back to like the 25% that, that Mary was talking about, that that's all really we can influence. And 75% is coming from all the different other, other touch points. So sales side, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the physical locations of those products or whatever the, whatever it is for every, for every business. I think that's the, something that we overlook and we overemphasize the importance of the marketing side mm -hmm. where it's just one small part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, we had a couple of case studies, like Ari had that uh, example of his hair product. I had yeah. the example of Apple, actually, that was an interesting one for me. Yeah. Um, and then, but the Tropicana one is the is the sort of classic case study. Like, it totally. makes me really like if if ever given the chance to change a brand logo, I don't know that I ever would. And distinctive assets is more than a logo. Yeah. I mean, but just the logo, the packaging, the you know, the colors, the distinctive assets. Like in the case of Tropicana, the orange getting stuck with the um, the straw. Yep. 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 Like. I would be so um, afraid to fuck it up. Like, I wouldn't want to change it. You. Like I'm with you. I, I really think it's probably a horrible idea. I'm with you. And it's funny because I think it's when Roger Martin talked to us about it first, yeah. when I really didn't think about it that way before. Yeah. Um. But I'm 100% with you now. Like It's the last lever you want to pull. And you better have a good reason that you're going to pull that. Like yeah. I, I brought the example of Aunt Jemima. Totally. I think that, yeah. I think that is one of those examples where like, yeah. yes. Washington Redskins. Exactly. Yeah, sure. But those are like, those are the exceptions. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like Eddie Bauer moving or taking cursive away from their logo. Yeah. What? Yeah. I know. I don't. Yeah. And, and it's funny because people justify it in all kinds of ways. Um, but yeah, it is dangerous. hundred percent. Yeah. That's really dangerous. Um, did anything else stick out to you V is for, like either in the terms of the presence, uh, the relevance in terms of the product offerings, prominence. Well, I, I think one thing that I really liked is, you know, the one, a few things that I wrote down. So like he talked about presence, prominence and portfolio. And those are all, those three things really kind of play into the, the importance of physical availability. But what I loved is his point around that it also goes beyond physical, sorry, physical availability goes beyond just the distribution of the product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? That was I good. Think, and I think that again, is another little nugget where you're like, you don't think about it that way because the, the naming implies that it's like making a product just simply physically available. Mm -hmm. But we talked about the leasing plans, right? Mm -hmm. So it, that has nothing to do about the product itself. What yeah. it has to do is how we're increasing its ability for you to purchase it as yeah. a consumer. So I think looking at it that way, just outside of distribution, I think is an important call out too. Yeah, that was a really good point. And that's the part for me that were that that was like such a really fascinating thing. Once I got it stuck in my head, I could buy this thing on a lease. Yeah. I'm like, I'm pointing at my computer, this thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this thing. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, that's perfect. Like it's 0% financing. Why would I not do that? Like it's 60 bucks a month instead of it being 2,100 bucks all at once. Yeah. I'm like that from a business point of view, I'm like, that makes way more sense. I can distribute the costs and blah, blah, blah. And then yeah. I was like, well, forget it. I'm not buying something 
for two grand, three grand, whatever it is. And, yeah. and shelling out that cash all at once today. Yeah. And, but even though the 16 inch monitor was available, like physically it was there. I, yeah. I just wouldn't pay for it because I didn't like, it was crazy. Like it's such a, yeah. Another thing that just Anyone? dawned on me and I, I wish I would have thought about it during the conversation. Uh, if you remember our conversation with, um, James and, um, uh, James Hankins and yeah. JP Castling. J JP Castling. Um, we're talking about digital availability. Yeah. Right. As essentially being like that third thing where they're really kind of creating that idea that it's not the physical and digital are not the same thing. Yeah. I know right now we're using or at least Ari and Darren Berger Masters look at physical availability for just anywhere the product is made available and 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 whatnot. But I think mm-hmm. I should have I should have thought about it earlier because I would have loved to hear his take on like the idea of digital availability. Well, we did talk about that a bit, but like we didn't, I know that James um, originally had said like, it's not the same thing. And I think the yeah. Amber Bass position is that it, it is the it same is. thing. Cause it, like an app on your phone is essentially digital availability. Yeah. Um, but even at that, like I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting point. Um, because it's, it really like, whether you want to call it digital or physical availability, you know, the, the conver the debate doesn't matter that much in the sense of like, it's another place to buy it. Yeah. Right. And so you have to be where there are people where they are buying things. And so call it what you will, but it matters to get out of your own way to make it easy for people to get the thing that they're trying to get. And to come back to your point at the very beginning, you know, easy to find, easy to buy. And I think you're right. Uh, Like think about a lot of the digital ads. We talked a little bit about that with Ari as well, but there's like shopping ads now. So basically you can just buy the product right within say Facebook or Instagram. So the the shop in shops, digital shop in shops where you're not even leaving and going to another website. Now you're just purchasing within the platform. Yeah. Yes, obviously that is a maybe a digital product, but at the end of the day, what is it doing? It's reducing the friction to purchase. Yeah. So it's a part of the idea of it being physically available when you think about it just beyond the distribution. Yeah. Um, of the product. So, anyways. Yeah, you don't want. To, so let's. I'm sorry. There's so many other things I want to talk to you about. No, I'm just kidding. I'm like, yeah, and another thing. <laughs> <laughs> but you, wait, going back to some of these conversations we had about ROAS and ROI, right? Mm-hmm. You can have an X, let's say in a 10 kilometer radius, you could have an excess of mental availability. It's possible to do that, but in, yep. and, but underserve that market with physical availability. Yeah. And so if you want to increase your ROI or ROAS on ads, you could mm-hmm. easily just cut spend. Yep. Right. Or you could increase your physical presence yep. and that will more than likely drive your ROI. Because you you have this excess, art, like mental availability, you're you're reaching more people. There's a whole bunch of people that know about you that physically can't get to your product. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's it's a different solution to the same kind of problem, but it it takes this sort of team approach to solving the problem as opposed to well, marketing's you know the only player in the space that can do anything about ROI. So let's just cut what we have, and that will fix things. Yeah, I think the only the only the only thing to that is like the cost. So the cost of opening up more physical stores potentially versus sure. you know tr- trying. And this is probably where a lot of organizations kind of get hung up on. It may cost me less, even though again going back to that conversation with yeah. uh, JP and and James is like we not everyone on an e-commerce is factoring in all the costs the right way. Um, it's actually very expensive to in, in, you know increase your distribution from a fit, from a digital perspective as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, whichever lever you decide to pull, I think it all needs to be rooted in that you've been able to build a level of mental availability mm-hmm. to make the case to start re- rethinking how physical availability uh, mm-hmm. is. Um, well, how you expand that? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, and they work in tandem, which is they do like they they help one helps the other. I think it was yeah, it's reciprocal. We, yeah. I think we I don't think we recorded this, but I think we oh, talked about it. <laughs> yeah. 
the the part around how like the one of the problems with the funnel or or the idea of um uh, yeah just the funnel let's the call linear it. yeah it, it takes the whole act of growing a brand and puts it squarely on the shoulders of marketing yeah when in reality like you could be doing all the things right running all the right ads and the person gets to a store or gets to your website and it's not available in their pro in their city or in their language yeah. or doesn't have the right size or whatever. And so, you know what I mean? Like there's so much do you remember value you in thinking the, about it this way. We did the presentation to pod, um, well, I guess a month ago or so. And what was interesting about going through that exercise was we brought up Cadbury, the, the garage ad. Mm -hmm. And we, yeah, we highlighted the, the great execution that it was from a creative perspective. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that even within the images, it was showing like how Cadbury with a dis the distinctive purple, like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. assets, the wrapping, not only yeah. how is that the wrapping, not only how is it positioned, say in like the convenience stores, but it's where it is in the points of the supermarkets that help add that additional layer of familiarity, right? Totally. Or mental availability, call it whatever you want. But I think that's showing how, an ad could transcend just um, can kind of be the bridge between both worlds. I think is the, yeah. is I think the, the, the role of marketing at the end of the day mm -hmm. is tying, building, helping build and tie mental availability to the physical availability of the products that you will experience as a consumer. For sure. Yeah. It's fascinating. I thought it was a great conversation. It was really fun. It, like it was a fun conversation too, because it was, it was a fun one. Yeah. It was good just to kind of talk about real stuff that you've, touched and felt and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah and i don't know if it's because like it's not an early morning interview for us it's like in closer to the end of the day or maybe our <laughs> brains aren't firing the way <laughs> they would have but no i i i genuinely enjoyed the conversation and ari if you are listening to this thank you thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us it was uh generally greatly appreciated and so with that v i will leave what it to you do? to well, I wouldn't say we go chase profitability, but that, this is the part where you I just totally jump do. in. Yeah, and then, you, and then you come in with like this say it? gusto and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> go chase profitability. <laughs> that's just what we do. We're I, nailing I, that this. fell flat. Oh, Ooh, that, it's suck. okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> This is good. All right, buddy. We'll this talk to great. you soon. Have a great evening, man. You too. Bye.